So one question that I get asked all the time is, MVG, I wanna get into a particular homebrew scene and write some homebrew, but where do I start? What, what do I need to do? What do I need to learn? And that's a very open-ended question with many different paths that you could choose to go down. Obviously, there are homebrew scenes out there for pretty much every system that has ever been released. There are active homebrew communities in all of those scenes. So where do you start? Now, for me, I always like to believe that if you want to learn how to write code, or if you want to learn how to make games, or even just mess around with something, you got to start with the basics. In my opinion, the best place to start has to be the Nintendo Game Boy. The system is simple in its design, yet powerful enough in the right hands. As you learn about developing on the system, you'll learn about its hardware and how to do more advanced things. The system truly is the perfect entry point. At its core, it only uses four colors, a 160 by 144 resolution screen, and it's completely tile-based. While very simple, the hardware does have some tricks up its sleeve, particularly when you start using interrupts to manipulate scan lines during vertical blank, and this has the ability to produce some stunning effects. Although I'm quite familiar with the Game Boy hardware itself, especially from an emulation perspective, I've never actually written any Game Boy games, or I've never actually written any code that targets the Game Boy itself. So we're going to take a look at a homebrew SDK known as the GBDK, which is a quite powerful development kit for the Nintendo Game Boy original, and we're going to see what type of things we can do with only a couple of hours worth of work. The GBDK or Game Boy Development Kit is an open source tool chain that allows for the user to develop programs or games that target the Game Boy or Game Boy Color. Setting up the GBDK is really simple to do. Just download it from the link provided in the description below and install it somewhere on your file system and add a path to the bin folder. I'm using Visual Studio Code for my setup, but you can use any IDE that you prefer. You'll also need to add the appropriate preprocessor include path so there are no missing header files. Now, as always, the first program that you write on any new hardware that you get is a simple Hello World program, and setting that up for the Game Boy was pretty standard to do. It's the same printf function that you've come to expect. Compiling the code is a simple use of a batch file that essentially just compiles the main.c file into an object file, and then from there links the object file and creates the .gb rom file. Loading the .gb ROM file up in an emulator will display our Hello World output. Welcome to the world of Homebrew on the Nintendo Game Boy. Now, one of the best things about Homebrew on the Nintendo Game Boy is that there are tools out there that are very mature and are essential to what you need, but they're also very easy to use. So let's go ahead and take a look at two of the most important tools that you'll need when developing games for the Nintendo Game Boy. The Game Boy is made up of tiles and to draw graphics on the Game Boy, everything is tile based. So we're going to go ahead and create a background on the Game Boy and then scroll it. Now the way to do that is to create some tiles. Now to do that, there are some really cool tools that you can use out there. One of them is known as the Game Boy Tile Designer and this is where you actually create your tiles. And then there's also the Game Boy Map Builder and it takes those tiles and then you can create your background maps based on that tile set. So let's go ahead and do something really, really simple for starters. The idea for this video was to create a simple background map that represented a horizontal scrolling game. I created a handful of tiles that would represent the ground, as well as a horizon to represent the distance in the scene. And then I created some mountains, utilizing a simple approach that was made famous in Super Mario Land. Essentially just diagonal lines, and this seemed to work pretty well. I also added ceiling tiles to the map. I'm not really sure why I did this. I just wanted to add a little bit more to this particular scene. So what we need to do now is export both the tiles sets that we've created, as well as the map itself. So to do that, what we do is we go to export to, and then what you wanna do is pick the gbdk.c file. Once all the tiles were created and my background map based on those tiles was created, the next thing that you need to do is export the tile map as well as the tile set to gdbk. And to do this, there is an export function specifically to output as a .c file. This creates a binary array of all the tile information as well as all the map information. 
and we can simply include this into our program. But as you can see, it's now pulled in the uh, tile set and this has all been generated from the tile and map editor and this is the tile map itself. So we have pulled in both of those things and now what we can do is start to build out a scrolling background. So how do we do that? Well, the next thing we wanna do now is create a main.c like we did with the Hello World program. Let's go ahead and include our background tile map. And let's go ahead and include our background tile set. Now, when you turn on a Game Boy, there is a couple of things that get initialized. You need to actually let the system know that you want the background to be displayed. Otherwise, it will be hidden. And you also need to let the system know that you need to turn the display on. By, by default, when you turn a Game Boy on, the LCD display is turned off until the program lets the hardware know that the it's time for the display to get turned on. So now let's go ahead and add a, a loop. So how do we pull in our tile sets and our tile map? Now to do that, you want to use a function called set background data to pull in the tiles. So let's go ahead and explain how this works. So we said previously that our tile designer had 10 tiles, zero to 10. So we're pulling in 10 tiles that we specified. And if you recall, we exported our tiles to the background tileset.c. And that, if we go ahead and take a look at that, you can see it's basically an array of, of data that stores our tile sets. So this is where our tile set lives. And we're telling the system that we're, we're basically utilizing that tile set in this particular program. Now, if we go back to the map builder, you recall that we set our map properties to 40 by 18. So 40 tiles across by 18 tiles down. And this is what we had built. And so what we want to do now is essentially go back to our set BG tiles and provide it the map width and the map height, as we said previously, and then the background tile map will be the, uh, the tile map. And so let's go ahead and add in a make file like we did previously. And the good news is we only have a main.c, even though we are referencing new .c files, we're just including those into the main.c. So the make file that we had in our hello world program won't actually be any different at all. It'll be exactly the same. Uh, let's see, make.bats. Oh, there we go. Just a path issue. And as you can see, it's created our .gb file like previously. So let's go ahead now and load into bgb. And then let's see what we get this time. And as you can see, it almost worked. Um, it looks like it's, it's missing some stuff here. So let's go ahead and see what's going on here. One of the easiest ways to debug your programs is to utilize an emulator such as BGB. BGB has the ability to view the background map and the tiles amongst many other things. One of the issues that I found was one of the ceiling tiles weren't being loaded. That was a pretty easy fix. I just needed to add one to the number of tiles that were being pulled in. But the other issue was a little more complex. Part of the mountain was missing. And this is simply because the Game Boy has only 32 kilobytes of RAM that can be utilized. And there's a really good chance that I exceeded the amount of RAM that can be used. So what I ended up doing was slightly decrease the number of tiles for the background map from 40 to 32. So how do we scroll this particular background? Well, there is a simple command to do that inside this loop. We can basically say scroll BKG and you can either scroll it um, in the X axes or the Y axes or both. So if I say scroll on the X axis one and leave the Y axis at zero, let's see what happens there. So we've got a our background and you can probably imagine, you know, having a sprite here, um, not necessarily making this like an endless runner game, but something that, that can control movement based on, you know, player character movement, for example, um, some type of platform game, so as you can see, we've got a basic background scrolling on our Game Boy hardware, and this is pretty straightforward to do, but let's 
take it to the next level and see if we can add some parallax scrolling to it. Adding a hardware parallax effect requires more knowledge of the Game Boy hardware. If you want to learn more about it, I recommend the pan docs that go into lots of detail about the hardware. I'll leave a link to those docs in the description below. To perform a parallax effect, what we need to do is tell the hardware that we want to scroll horizontal lines at different speeds to simulate depth. To do this, we enable the LYC register. An interrupt can then be triggered that says, if the value in my LYC register is equal to the current scanline position, trigger an interrupt handler, and inside that handler, we can then adjust the position of that scanline. There are 144 visible scanlines on the Game Boy hardware, and each of them can be adjusted mid-frame. But keep in mind, if you do this, you may want to ensure that you have enough cycles available for sprite movement and other things that need to be handled. Otherwise, you may run into issues. If we take a look at our map here, or if we take a look at, at, at this view, this is scanline zero, and this is scanline 144. So as we start drawing lines, or as, as the Game Boy hardware starts drawing line, line by line, it'll start at 0 to 144. Now, I don't have the exact way of calculating this, and maybe there is a way to calculate it, but so I'm going to take an estimated guess and say from, from 0 to, let's say, 30, this is one particular scroll. So let's go ahead and say if LYC reg is equal to 0, we want to move the background by scroll by a value of scroll 1, on the x-axis and zero on the y-axis and now we also want to say lyc reg is now equal to let's say 30. so what we're telling the system here is if it hits scanline zero we're scrolling it this far and now we're setting the register to 30. so once it hits 30 We want to scroll it by another amount and maybe there's a way to figure that out but let's just take a guess and say it's scan line 100 uh, and that that may be that may be way off base but let, let's we'll fiddle with it as we as we go through this so let's make this 64 and then when the lyc reg is 64 we want to move scroll three and then once we're done here we set this back to zero with the interrupt handler in place the next thing that i did was set values for scroll one two and three scroll one represents the ceiling or the highest part of the screen scroll two represents the mountain area and scroll three is the ground I decided to add a scroll 4 so I could have two different levels of scrolling on the ground, just to give it more of that Shadow of the Beast look about it. I spent some time fiddling with some of the values and making sure that my interrupt handler was doing what it was supposed to. But this is the final result, and I think it turned out pretty well. Now the final part of this video was to add player movement. In other words, instead of scrolling the background like in an Endless Runner type game, we want to scroll the background if the joystick is being pushed left or pushed right. This is simulating player movement if we had a sprite on screen. GDBK polls the joystick and returns values if there's any input button presses. We then simply put this code inside our while loop. If the D-pad is being pushed to the right, we increment our scrolling variables as we did previously. But if it's being pushed to the left, we decrease them by the same amounts. This is not necessarily the proper way to do things as when we talk about player movement, we must consider acceleration, but it's good enough for this particular video. And now let's take a look at the result. So if we load our ROM now, now you can see there's no movement because we're basically wired up our scrolling to character movement or our joystick movement. So now you can see as I'm pressing down on the buttons left and right, the backgrounds are scrolling in the direction of the movement. And this is something that you would have a, a player sprite or maybe a ship sprite. Maybe it's a shoot 'em up game or a platformer or a run and gun style game. And you can see now we're starting to get an idea about a game 
that potentially we can we can think of that we could build. Now, one thing that I do stress that you do is even though emulation is good in 99% of cases, every once in a while, make sure that you test your code on original hardware. Emulators for the Game Boy are very, very accurate, almost perfect these days, but there's always going to be that unknown quantity when it comes to running your, your game or your piece of code on original hardware. There are different methods when it comes to testing your ROM on real hardware, but for me, I like to keep it simple. I use an EverDrive cartridge that I've had for years. I just copy the .gb file onto my SD card and then boot it on original hardware. And as you can see, the demo that we built for this particular episode works just fine. And for those people interested, there was about 78 lines of code that was written for this particular demo, and I will leave a link to it in the description below. Now I will tell you that it's not anywhere near the most elegant code that I've ever written. It was pretty much just hacked up in a couple of hours for this video. But you can get a sense of how powerful it is to utilize something like the GDBK and get access to some really cool features of the Game Boy. And it does spurn a lot of creativity when it comes to writing your own games. You have a very limited sandbox in order to build your games in. And I think that's one of the most compelling reasons to start developing games on the Game Boy. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this look at the GBDK, the Game Boy Development Kit. I do believe that if you are looking to get into homebrew for the first time, you do have some programming knowledge. This is the best place to get started. It does teach you the basics but the basics are always very, very important as well. Now, this particular episode is only one part of a larger series that I'm planning on doing, essentially just kind of walking through the gambit of different things that you can do with the Game Boy Development Kit and essentially make a fully fledged game. And the end result of this, I don't know how many parts this is going to take, but we are going to continue down this particular series and ultimately end up writing just a, a basic homebrew game that you can download and play. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. If you liked it, leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.